Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to Mailbag. My name is John Campy. I'll be one of your hosts today, and I'm joined by your other host today, Mr. Mark Ellis. You know, John, the shot on us looks great for all the people out there watching at home, but our view right now, I feel like I'm at a congressional hearing about to give testimony. <laughs> it does feel that way a little bit. I feel like the it? lights are, it, it, it's like, remember in, uh, in True Lies when they were interrogating Carlos the Jackal? <laughs> This is that scene. I did not have sex with that woman. <laughs> uh, yeah, so this is the laid back, more relaxed show. Where all we do is take your questions. How do you get a question to us? It's simple. Just send us an email to collidervideo at gmail.com. Now, we take questions out of that email for Movie Talk Monday through Friday and here on the weekends, but also we take it from my Twitter, from my Facebook, whatever. Wherever you can send us questions, we try to gather some up. So without any further ado, we get a whole ton of them to get through. Let's get started. And question number one comes from Brandon Smith, who writes, Hey, guys, you do a great job putting out entertaining and informative shows. Thank you very much. Thank you, Brandon. I'm <laughs> blushing. And that was the whole question. No. Um, <laughs> my question is, what are your thoughts on the new TV series coming out adapting the Taken movies? Thanks for taking my question and keep kicking ass. You know what? Last night, I was at the uh, LA Kings game. Mm -hmm. And they had uh, along the scoreboard the Taken premiering, I believe it's on the 27th. Yep. And I completely forgotten that's coming out. So they're doing, you know, look, they've got uh, one on, uh, what's the cop one they just did based on the... Uh well, uh, you have Lethal Weapon that was based on Lethal it. Weapon. Yeah. Um, but but what's interesting about this show, Taken, is that it's a prequel to what we saw in the movie. So it's the same character. I wasn't aware of it's that. It's Brian Mills. It's just what Brian Mills was like as a young man before he had a family. It's how he acquired his certain set of skills. His, his specific set of skills grow each and every episode. This is very intriguing as a way to do a show because as we've seen with movies like with Taken and hopefully with The Equalizer, we get a lot of movies, but they don't always necessarily pan out as well as the first film so instead of just continuing to water down sequels maybe we can go back and explore how we got to that point especially when the action premise is based around a middle-aged star like a Liam Neeson or a Denzel Washington mm -hmm. so we don't need to see them matriculate into a retirement home what we could do <laughs> is we could see how they got to the place they are in life I'm not saying the show is going to be good but it's kind of a unique way to put a spin on it are they supposed supposed to be is this supposed to be in continuity with the show do you think i think is it is canon is it canon it, it is it is That's canon but but a young brian mills has not met famke jance yet he obviously has not had maggie grace as his daughter yet so he's learning the ways and as you recall from the taken movie he's got his buddies that they used to go on missions with That's and right and they, they, they drink at barbecues they talk about oh remember that one time we were in panama remember that one time we were in buenos Aires? wherever the hell they were around the world we're gonna get to see that from the tv show i sound like i'm selling it really hard and that i love it i have not seen one lick of it but i'm kind of sort of maybe a little Titillated. From what you understand, so it's supposed to be like set in the mid '80s or something like that. I would assume so. Are yeah, supposed to be in Canada. Okay, well there you go. Because I was wondering if it's actually based on Taken. It's like how far can you stretch that premise? Like the the Taken premise. You know okay. what I mean? How far can <laughs> one guy just horrible at keeping track of his family? <laughs> All right, let's move on to the next question. The next question comes from Jeff Bingham, who writes. What movie do you think will be comedy of the year this year? Nothing looks especially Ooh. promising. Fist Fight looks like it could be quickly forgotten based on its opening weekend box office yeah. performance. The less said about chips, the better. Snatched <laughs> looks like it could go either way. I'm interested in Baywatch, but cautious about it as well. And The House looks like it has potential. But I've grown tired of movies featuring comedians just doing their routine. Mark, what? any comedies of 2017 you think will be the standout comedy of the year? Like, do we have a, a Bridesmaids coming out this year? Well, as a comic who never gets sick of doing his routine, <laughs> I will tell you that the, it's always hard to prognosticate comedy coming out in any given year when we're this early into 2017 because they're not the big blockbusters that we see trailers for months and months ahead of time. Sometimes they sneak up on you, and a lot of times that's the way I'd prefer it. Like mm. something like Bad Moms this past summer oh, yeah. really impressed me. It wasn't on my radar before. I saw a trailer. I was like, ah, it could be okay, and it really impressed me. A couple of movies I'm keeping my eye on that are going to be a little under the radar, a little smaller. There's a movie coming out at the beginning of the summer, and it's called Folk Hero and Funny Guy. And it's about a stand-up comedian who goes on tour with his very successful folk singer buddy to open for him. And I think that could be a little funny, a little dramatic. You could get a nice uh, mix of Who's tugging at that? the heartstrings. Who's plugged in that? Wyatt Russell is one of the big stars in that movie. Okay. Kurt Russell's kid. He's great in, uh, in Everybody Wants Some. He's in an episode of The American Black Mirror that he's really good in. So I look for him to really deliver in this movie. 
There's a film coming out in August, which is a nice bed for the end of the summer for a comedy to come out and really surprise you, and that's called Villa Capri. Now, what this movie is about is you got Morgan Freeman and Tommy Lee Jones, and they they had a lot of uh, sparring in their in their heyday. Now they're in a retirement home. And things start to happen to the retirement home. Rene Russo moves in as the young new person on the scene there. And if this movie is one tenth as funny as the Del Boca Vista storyline from Seinfeld, Del we're Boca in Vista. for a late summer treat. What do you got? The one I'm looking forward to is actually one that could go either way, but I think it has potential and it could be awful, but potential. And it's called The Hitman's Bodyguard. It's Ryan Reynolds and Samuel L. Jackson, yeah. where a international hitman is now retiring and he needs a bodyguard and they need to take down some international assassins who are trying to assassinate some big world leaders or something along they those always lines. They, they never just try to pick off the guy in the street corner they're always going after somebody internationally world renowned no no, no. see when you're an average guy in the street corner that's called murder <laughs> when you're a famous <laughs> YouTube celebrity ah, ah, it's you. an assassination are you saying I'm famous enough to get assassinated I'm saying if you get taken out they will call it an assassination ooh, ooh this might be worth it yeah so I mean look and again like Ryan Reynolds has had comedies that have been really funny. He's had comedies that have not. Samuel Jackson, the same thing. In his illustrious career, he's got just as many bad films as he does good. But you can't deny the potential there. there. Now, Edgar Wright, uh, is it Baby Driver? Is that the name of Edgar Wright's film that he's he's got coming out? That also looks like it could, but I don't know if he's going comedy yeah. with that. He normally does. So that could be interesting. So there's a whole bunch of possibilities out there. We'll have to keep our eyes open for it. All right, let's go on to the next one. The next question comes from Janiel Janiel Warsowski, cool. who writes, Hey guys, quick question. With all the drama surrounding the DC films, with multiple directors coming and going, scripts getting written and thrown out, why do you still insist Wonder Woman will be good? <laughs> um, okay, well, be, okay, so, so a couple of things. Um, I have a lot of faith in the Wonder Woman film, and, and it comes from a couple of key points for me personally. Number one, now, granted, we've seen great trailers to bad movies. I know mm -hmm. we have. But it's a good starting point if you can put out a good trailer. The Wonder Woman trailers haven't just been good. They've been outstanding. Uh, I mean, I think it was like my trailer, uh, my second favorite trailer of the year. I called it my number one trailer of the year, but I forgot that that Johnny Cash Logan trailer came out in 2016. So Chewy were home? It was not... Was it was number three for you? I think it was number three or four. Okay. Yeah, yeah, Fair it enough. was. But that Wonder Woman trailer clearly at one Comic-Con. I remember we did our Comic-Con wrap-up It stuff. was It was amongst the biggest buzz all summer. But I think it was a unanimous, too, when we were doing our Comic-Con wrap-up, that it was unanimous, the best trailer mm -hmm. coming out of Comic-Con. I mean, the Kong one was great. The Justice League one was really good. But that Wonder Woman one blew our socks off. And then the follow-up one was even better. Reason number two is I believe in Patty Jenkins. I believe she's going to do a really good job with this. I, I just think I've got a lot of trust in her as a storyteller. Reason number three, in its own way, this is a pretty isolated film because it does happen in the past. They're not worried about how will this time it tie into the events of BVS, although I'm sure they will on mm -hmm. some level. How will it lead into the next events coming up in Justice League? Although I'm sure there will be little things here and there. For the most part, this is an isolated standalone film because it's isolated in a different period of time. So you got Patty Jenkins in there. You got a great trailer. You got it fairly isolated. But also, this is a completely different team of filmmakers. This is point number four. Then have worked on any of the other DC Cinematic Universe films so far. It's not directed by Zack Snyder. It's a different set of writers. You have a different cast of players there. And so I believe, look, Wonder Woman might suck. Absolutely. But I think there's enough pieces there for us to say we're optimistic. Now, everybody knows I, I don't like Gal Gadot as Wonder Woman, but that almost doesn't even really matter. If you have a skilled director who knows how to play to their performer's strengths while hiding their weakness, like what James Gunn did with Dave Bautista in Guardians of the Galaxy, accentuated his strengths, hit his weaknesses where he had to, you can get a fun, compelling movie and I think it can work. And I am betting on it that Wonder Woman will be that film that'll be the first DC cinematic film of this new DC cinematic universe that 
will get 75 or a plus on a Rotten Tomatoes meter. But I don't know. Do you have a lot of faith in the Wonder Woman movie? I, I certainly do. And one of the reasons is because I'm a lot higher than you on Gal Gadot being Wonder Woman. Mm-hmm. But even if I wasn't, you hit on a key point that I wanted to mention is the isolation aspect of this, which doesn't necessarily spell confidence in the entire DCEU going forward that <laughs> we feel like this movie is so far removed from everything else happening. And I got that from when we met the cast and crew at Comic-Con. When we yeah. got to see how much fun they had on set, it was almost like the George Miller Mad Max Fury Road situation where they just got to right, go yeah, off on yeah. some desolate part of the world and make a fun little movie. They seem to have a good time doing it. And as far as the trailers go, yeah, the trailers have been great. There have been great trailers to awful movies, as you said, but I'm not going to condemn a movie just because the trailer's been great because I've been burned before. I thought the Suicide Squad trailers were great. They ended up being not such a great movie. Wonder Woman, these trailers have been fantastic. And there's not a lot of pressure on this movie to die in to tie into the DCEU as a whole. There's a lot of pressure on Wonder Woman to give us yeah. faith in the movies going forward, but its its actual plot line can be standalone. I think that's a huge plus going for it. You just raise up a really good point: is that as each progressive look, there was going to be a lot of pressure on Wonder Woman movie no matter what. It's in the new age of comic book films. It's the first female led superhero movie. Like if right, you want to go back right. to like earlier years, yeah, yeah. Like we had Aeon Flux and we had Calvin Sure, but in this mm-hmm. new age, the post. Iron Man age, if you will. This is the first really big ticket, massively famous, Mount Rushmore of superheroes, female-led superhero movie. So it already had that pressure. But as Man of Steel, which I consider a masterpiece of the genre, but as Man of Steel failed to get widespread critical praise, as Batman versus Superman failed to get widespread critical Mm -hmm. praise, as Suicide Squad failed to get widespread critical praise, the pressure on Wonder Woman to perform has mounted higher and higher and higher. And it's unfair. I'm not saying it's fair. It's not fair. It's unfair, but that is the reality. And I think it's got a chance to, in one film, I've said this every time a new DC movie comes out, in one film, it could change the overall perception of the DC Cinematic Universe. But will it do it? Will it do it? No. It won't because this movie could be great, but it's not going to change our overall perception because since Wonder Woman was shot and edited and all that stuff, we've had so much more turmoil in the DCU and things mm. changing that we didn't want to have changed. So you were just going into production on Wonder Woman. I think that that production as a whole would feel a lot more pressure on it than That's it true. did at the time they made it. I think Wonder Woman is going to be fantastic, but I'm not going to walk out of Wonder Woman being like, all right, now everything's right because I see stories every day about directors. Are we going to sign this guy? Is this going to happen? Is this not happening anymore? So there's still too much change over there to give me confidence in all of it going forward. I want to love all this stuff. I just don't think I can. Having said that, Wonder Woman I think is going to be top notch. But it would be a big step in the right direction. Be a huge step in the right direction, yeah. All right, next question comes to us from Dave Perez who writes, do Oscar voters re-vote after nominees are announced or are the winners determined based on the original round of voting? Well, it's funny you should ask that question. We have a little video called Crash Course and there was we did a Crash Course video specifically on how the Oscar nomination process works. Kenny Napsok hosted it. Mm-hmm. It's one of the best we've ever done. You should definitely go back and check that out. But here's the basics of it. There are There's a round of voting to determine your nominees but not everybody votes on it. Let's say, for example, Mark Ellis was a Hollywood director and I was a Hollywood actor. Both believable, I'm sure. So what happens is the director's branch of the Academy, of which Mark would be a member of, action. they determine, they vote, and they determine the nominees for best director. Actors don't vote for who would be nominated as best director. Mm-hmm. Producers don't, the music people don't, the screenwriters don't. No. What happens is the actors then, the acting branch of the Academy, votes on who they sh- think should be the acting nominees. The screenwriters branch vote on who they think the nominees should be for screenwriters. Now, that's how the nominations get settled. Once the nominations are settled, then the directors put forward their nominations for best director, the actors put forward their nominations for all the acting categories, the screenwriters put forward their nominations for screenwriting. Now the nominations are done. Then everybody gets to vote on all the nominees. So there are two rounds of voting. One round of voting by each specific branch to to determine the nominees from their specific branch. And then the second round of voting is to determine the winners. Am I leaving anything out here? Uh, No, and it's a lot better of a way than the Hollywood Foreign Press does it for the Golden Globes, which is, hey, whoever wants to come to Vegas first, your movie's getting nominated. (laughs) Yay! Okay. (laughs) The next question comes from Hayden Claiborne. I almost thought it was Hayden Christensen. Hayden Claiborne writes, 
What is your favorite non-superhero comic book film? For me, it's Old Boy. Old Boy is a good one. Old Boy is a damn good one, yeah. Um, Road to Perdition? Road is, to Perdition is... The one with Tom Hanks? Was based on a comic book, That's Yeah, it was right. based on a graphic novel. That's right. Uh, I'm trying to think, that's a great question. I'm trying to think of all the comics that I read and if any of them were actually involving in super... Or not it not necessarily superheroes, classic superheroes as we know it. Because when I was a kid, I yeah, I loved like all the, the, the DC and Marvel and Image comics. But I also was a huge fan of some of the more independent ones like Bone or Milk and Cheese. Now, unfortunately, they have oh not had God, movies made cheese. yet. So we're still waiting for that Milk and Cheese movie. That would be the one I would pin my hopes on. So I guess until then, what do I got to say? Richie Rich? Um... I guess Kingsman Secret Service is not technically I guess a not superhero. Yeah, that's, that's fair. So I guess that one fits yeah. in there as well. A uh, good question. Okay. Next question comes from uh, Marcos Lopez Ortiz, who writes uh, Hey guys, love the show and greetings from Puerto Rico. What are the possibilities of another shot for a Pearl Harbor movie? Michael Bay's version really sucked. Yeah, it wasn't good. Yeah, it wasn't a great trailer. Great trailer. <laughs> yes, All-time great trailer, but the movie was just not good. I would totally be up for seeing another Pearl Harbor movie that doesn't give us all that unnecessary fictionalized love triangle BS. There's so much mm. on that story anyway of the tragic events that happened at Pearl Harbor, how that became the the rallying cry for the United States entering World War II full-fledged. So there's so much there anyway. I, I still don't know why Michael Bay was like, oh, we need to have uh, this weird Twilight love triangle in there as well. It was funny. I was... Uh I was at Staples Center in LA watching a hockey game and like a clip from Team America World Police came on. And wasn't there like a little song in that? It's like, I miss you more than Michael Bay missed the mark on yeah. Pearl Harbor or something like that. <laughs> yeah, it, it was pretty bad. But I remember watching the first time and I was still, I still kind of liked it the first time I watched it just because I was in the visual effects world. And at the time, what oh, they, they did, yeah. visuals in there mm -hmm. was actually really impressive. Yes, I do think there's another screenwriter, another director out there somewhere who will take another crack. It's such a, a pivotal point in the history of the company, of the company, of the country, and worked into that is a built-in huge scale action sequence mm -hmm. with global you know, repercussions and multiple action sequences you can set outside of that too. It's just, it's a blockbuster begging to be, to happen. I just think they need to wait a few more years, let the stench of the Michael Bay one, you know, wear off a little mm -hmm. bit and then maybe they can, t do you think they'll, they'll take another crack at it? I think so. Let's see how successful Dunkirk is. I mean, that's a, that, that's a yeah, lesser told yeah. World War II story, though no less important on a, on an international scale. I think that, uh, I mean, nothing's as important as Pearl Harbor, uh, in that regard, but I think Pearl Harbor should get another chance at the big screen. Uh, quick question for you, love triangle wise. If you're Kate Beckinsale's character, right? And yeah. you think your boy Affleck is dead at sea and then Hartnett, you, you, you start getting together with him and then Affleck comes back to life who you taking do you stick with heart in it do you go with Affleck I go back to Affleck in a heartbeat thanks for playing see you back on the bench Affleck you're back in you know what there's another there was a good movie that actually played that same scenario out it was Castaway with Tom Hanks Remember, because he had his girl, thought he had died. He comes back, but she's now married somebody else. And, and has a I, family. if I was Helen Hunt, I'm taking Hanks back. I don't care if he has to make love to a volleyball once a week. I am taking <laughs> Hanks back. I don't know, man. That's uh, I'm saying you stick with your current commitment. This was uh, guess what? It was four years. Okay, I get it. Affleck was gone for like what a month. It's a t <laughs> Affleck was gone. Yeah. He was okay. Well, uh, yeah, that would probably change the scenario a little bit. All right. Let's move on to the next question, and that comes from Michael K. Of course, this weekend is the Oscars, so Michael K. is asking, what are you most looking forward to at the Oscars on Sunday night? Personally, I can't wait to see Matt Damon, Jimmy Kimmel's interactions. Yeah, <laughs> yeah no, look, I hate the... Um, I hate the musical performances at the Oscar. You're, you've don't, never been a fan. No, never been a fan. I think it's like, uh, uh, what I mean by musical performances, I don't mean the song and dances and stuff like that. I mean the performances of best original song because by the end of the night, you have dedicated more screen time at the Oscars to probably the least important category than you do to best picture. Because by the time they all, like five nominees, sing all five of their songs, you've literally dedicated more time to something that takes place for two minutes in a movie than best director gets screen time. You know, it, to me, it's infuriating. But 
I will admit, and this is a bit hypocritical, I, I acknowledge, I don't know how to reconcile this, is that I really wanted Dwayne Johnson to get nominated for best song for Your Welcome <laughs> from Moana. Now, Moana did have a song nominated, but it wasn't Your Welcome. Mm -hmm. I was dying to see Lynn manuel, uh, manuel Miranda and The Rock singing Your Welcome at the Oscars. That's not going to happen. I, to me, it's... I really want to see what Jimmy Kimmel does. Yep. It's been a while since universally we all sat back and went, that was a great job by mm -hmm. an Oscar host. I mean, I like what, uh, oh, Family Guy. Um, uh, Seth MacFarlane. Seth MacFarlane did. And, I like what uh, not a lot of people did, but I did. Yeah. Uh, um, Chris Rock, uh, I thought, adjudicated himself very well uh, last year. Um, but you're right. I mean, we had the Neil Patrick Harris's and the Anne Hathaway and James Franco's. And it's even Ellen DeGeneres. It's like, I, I hate when they get too saddled with bits in between. That's what I would love to mm -hmm. cut out most of those bits in between. The musical performances I'm fine with, but I love the opening monologue by the host. I I love picturing myself what I would be able to do in that situation. Jimmy Kimmel, I think, was a great choice to host this year's Oscars. So I'm excited what his sense of humor brings to this yeah. award show. I'm really curious to see what he does as well. All right. Next question comes from Jacob Blunden, who writes, if The Last Jedi leaked online in Blu-ray quality 12 <laughs> weeks before it came out in theater, would you download it illegally or risk knowing no, or risk it knowing that it will most likely be spoiled for you. Uh, risk. Uh, okay. Um, so I get to download it illegally. Is there any risk at all that I'm going to get caught? Because I do not want to get much caught. as normal. Any much as a normal, you know, illegal downloading. Then, then yeah, I mean, if somebody, if, if the good folks at Disney came to me and they said, "Look, Mark, you're the one guy we really trust with this," and they brought that to me <laughs> 12 weeks ahead of time, I would totally watch it. If it was downloading it illegally, I just, even if it's the slightest chance of, and I've broken the, law, I've been arrested multiple times. But if I <laughs> download this and there's even the slightest chance that Disney gets mad at me and I never again get invited to a Star Wars premiere. It's not worth it oh. for me. But if you just gave me a computer screen and said, here's The Last Jedi, I don't think that I could resist the temptation. You know, here's This is the funny thing. I think there are other movies like the new Justice League, the new uh, the, the new Avengers, the, the next, I don't know, uh, Megaforce uh, sequel that should have been made 15 years ago. All that kind of stuff. I think there are environments. Because look, my opinion personally is... Pirating movies is your is theft. It's criminal. Mm -hmm. you, sh you shouldn't do it. It's it's immoral. It's criminal. All that kind of stuff. But I will admit my own weakness that if I found out the new Avengers movie or the new Batman movie or whatever was online right now and I could watch it, I know I have enough faith in my own weakness to know there is a good chance I would do that. <laughs> Look, you're Canadian, but you're also human. Yeah, I'm I'm, I'm human. But with Star Wars, there is this added little thing where I'd be like. If I down, illegally download this, I could be hurting Star Wars. And I couldn't live with myself if that were the case. John, the mouse is going to recover. <laughs> and I it's know, fine. but just knowing it's Star Wars because I love Star Wars enough, I'd be, I might, the, I, there's a way I could be hurting Star Wars and I wouldn't be able to bring myself Okay, so to here's it. what we do. We share it together and we don't watch the entire movie. We just watch it until we get the first real surprise or twist and then we stop the movie. We go make a bet with Christian Harloff for $100 <laughs> that this is going to happen. So we come out of it making a little bit of cash. I thought you said we both download it and you watch all the even number of movies minutes and I watch all the odd number of minutes so neither of us have actually seen the full let's, thing let's put our heads together <laughs> okay let's move on to the next thing uh, another Oscar question from Brandon Zubitate who writes is La La Land sweeping the Oscars this Sunday 14 nominations if it got all of those it would break the record by three I believe yes, currently held by say with me Lord of the Rings Titanic and Ben-Hur the original at not 11, the remake. At 11. Um, <laughs> not the remake. I think you got to point that out. I think that uh, it's not going to sweep the Oscars. I think it'll do in the six to eight uh, statue range. And I think that there could be a split at the top where I think Emma Stone is definitely going to win Best Actress. I do not think yeah. Ryan Gosling is going to win Best Actor, Agreed. but he was very good. I think that between director and picture, a lot of times what the Academy likes to do is if they have two movies they really love for Best Picture, in this case it would be La La Land and Moonlight, I think that the director gets one of them and that the picture one gets the other one. I think La La Land is going to get Best Picture and I think Barry Jenkins might sneak out and upset Damien Chazelle for Best Director. How many statues do you see this baby taking home? I don't see it breaking the record. 
uh, there's just too many in here that I think are questionable. Like you mm-hmm. point out, I don't think Ryan Gosling has any chance uh, of winning Best Actor. Although he's he's wonderful in it, uh, for sure. He's wonderful in it. I do believe Damon Giselle is probably going to win Best Director. It's probably going to be very hard to beat for Best Original Musical Score. Mm-hmm. That's probably getting that. It will probably win Best Original Screenplay, although I don't think it should. Uh, I do not think it'll win Best Cinematography, so there's another one it won't win. I don't think it's going to win for Best Costume Design, so there's another one it won't win. Mm-hmm. It's got a very good chance for Best Film Editing, but it's also nominated for Best Sound Editing, and I do not think it'll win for Sound Editing, so right there, we're already below that number 11. Is Rogue One also Sound Editing? I is believe it, it is. is it, let's have Star Wars stop <laughs> La La Land from getting the record. Yeah, so I think it's going to do, I think it's going to do better than any other film at the Oscars this year. Sure. But I do not think it will like break records. So will it sweep? Well, not sweep 14, but it will be, I believe, by the end of the night that we're going to all say, yep, La La Land was the definitive winner. Unless something sneaks in there, whether it's Moonlight, which probably has the best chance of beating mm-hmm. it for best pictures, probably Moonlight. I'm still rooting for Hacksaw Ridge, although I don't think, really think it has an outside chance. <laughs> um, but unless Moonlight sneaks in there and captures that best picture, if it does... And La La Land wins like 10 Academy Awards, it won't be considered a dominant sweep if it doesn't win that big trophy. That's an awesome point. I remember as clear as day when Saving Private Ryan got upset for Best Picture by Shakespeare in Love because the award they gave out before was Best Director and Steven Spielberg had won it. And he was talking and he gave a speech. It looked like it paved the way. But Steven Spielberg, you could tell in his speech, he was holding back because it was like, okay, I'm going to give, I'm going to really give the the full speech when we win Best Picture. (laughs) And then they didn't get it. So we never got to hear what Stevie would have said. If I'm La La Land and I, if Damien Chazelle wins Best Director, say everything that you want to say because there is a solid chance that Moonlight does get that Best Picture win. All right, let's do a couple more here. Uh, Jason Randall writes, if the solo film is out next May, uh, how and when do you see the May and December Star Wars release dates happening? This is a discussion that Harloff likes to bring up Christian a lot. is is the, the champion of the bandwagon. He is at the wheels for this, this two Star Wars movies a year movement, which I just don't think I'm ever going to be on board with. And that's not to say that if, Han, let's say Han Solo came out in May and then we got episode nine in December. I would love seeing those movies. I cannot wait to see those films, but there's something special about having a little bit of time to anticipate seeing a Star Wars film, getting the proper rollout as far as a teaser trailer, a full trailer, us buzzing about what we're going to see, what might happen, what the future of Star Wars holds. I love, love, love the anticipation. It's a tantric experience for me seeing a Star Wars movie, so I want there to be no more than one Star Wars film a year. I think the rollout would obviously be episodic in December and then yep. do a Star Wars spinoff story in May if they were to do that somewhere down the road. Yeah, now, of course, they've already kind of set the pattern with Rogue One that they did a spinoff in December as well. Right. I thought it was interesting that we speculated for a long time that we thought that Solo, we were actually convinced that that Han Solo movie was going to get moved to a December date. But mm-hmm. it looks like they're sticking with the May date. And I think a lot of that is just to celebrate Star Wars being May 25th again. Yes. 25th? May 25th, yeah. Because May 25th yep, was when was it came one. out in 1977. Yep, so I think that they just want to make a big deal about, hey, May 25th, we did it in the 70s, we're doing it in the 2000 teens. Star Wars still kicking ass. And then maybe they go back to December. I hope they do. I'm completely with you, though, on the I like one Star Wars film a year. I, I just like it that way. It, it feels good. We've never in our history had one Star Wars film a year. We are living in an age where we do now. Let's not push it. I and think it's good. I don't mind Star Wars taking a year off. After we get episode nine, I don't mind Star Wars saying, okay, well, we're going to we're gonna launch this this Old Republic trilogy, but we're going to need a couple years to really get in and sink our teeth into it. I'd be fine with that. I don't need a Star Wars movie every year, and God forbid you sacrifice some of the quality. We haven't seen it yet, yeah. and I don't want to see that happen anytime soon. All right, last question of the day, and this one comes from uh, Chris uh Corican, who writes, can Michael Bay be trusted with a well-known property as a director or a producer after Transformers, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, horror remakes, etc.? I personally think not. What do you think? Well, look, jumping on Michael Bay is a time-honored tradition amongst <laughs> film fans, and he's given us a lot of ammunition to do it. But whenever Michael Bay comes up, I do like to remind people of a couple things. Number one, this is the guy who directed The Rock. Love The Rock. Who doesn't like The Rock? Second best action movie of the 90s, just under Point Break. I love The Rock. It's fantastic. 
Armageddon is actually a guilty pleasure of mine. Yeah, I have yeah. a lot of fun with that. I thought Pain and Gain, uh, Pain and Gain was pretty good. Bad Boys, uh, bad. There's Bad Boys, and you really enjoyed uh, Thirteen Hours. Thirteen is Hours. Fan. Fantastic filmmaking. So, I mean, amidst films like Transformers 2, 3, and 4, amidst uh, films like The Island, amidst uh, films like, you know, that kind of stuff, there are good films he's done. He's a he's a guy who can make a good, be a good filmmaker. But he hasn't handled franchises as well. And I'll even stick up for the, as a producer, I'll stick up for the first Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movie he did. A lot of potential there. I enjoyed that uh, film. Y- yes, but what I will bury t- Ninja Turtles on is that Ninja Turtles 2 felt like too much mm-hmm. Michael Bay in there. And that's yeah. why we probably won't get a Ninja Turtles 3. Yeah, I completely agree. So, look, would I, if I'm a producer and I'm a film head, do I have faith in a movie we're doing that has Michael Bay attached as either a director or a producer? I'm going to say, yeah. I, maybe maybe not all the confidence in the world, but I would feel, yeah, this could work. Giving him one of our franchises? Probably no. What if, do you think? if you're the head of a studio, I have a lot of confidence because look at what he's done internationally for Transformers. And well, international too, dollars yeah. ring just as highly at the bank as the American dollars do, depending on what the exchange rate is, I guess. But Michael Bay is a guy who creates money for studios. That's why he is still working and has his pick of projects, whatever he wants to do. I'm thinking from the level of a fan, if I have to give a franchise to Michael Bay right now, you know which one I throw at him? Which one? G.I. Joe. I give him G.I. Joe on multiple levels. One, because I think he could do a lot of cool action. I love the 13-hour stuff, but also have these fun characters that can get a little cartoonish with the violence, but still make it look neat. Plus, he also does Transformers. And if we can get G.I. Joes and Transformers in the same universe, why not? Because guess what? Most Transformers fans would not mind seeing this current run that we're on blow up and then rebuild it from the ground up. So why don't we blow it up in the most spectacular fashion possible and have them team up with G.I. Joes for a couple movies and then we'll scrap the whole project after that. John Campia, I challenge you. G.I. Joe Transformers, you in? You know what? Here's the funny thing. You know, recently, uh, it was about a year ago, they announced that Paramount put together this writer's room, the Transformers writer's room, <laughs> where they, I think it was Akiva Goldsman or whatever. Like, it it was 20 film luminaries who are all steeped in science fiction war they all have great credits they got wood ranch catered in that day <laughs> they drew a lot of cool ideas on a blackboard then michael bay came in and uh, erased it with his butt you know i'm gonna let a little secret out a buddy of mine was actually hired to go into that writer's room and he's an artist and as they were throwing out ideas he would sketch out what those ideas would look like really yeah it's 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 amazing where but, are those sketches what booth at comic-con are those sketches going to be available they're probably at? on uh, steven spielberg's galaxy <laughs> note or something like that they're not going anywhere um look but i heard rumors that coming out of that writer's room that one of the ideas pitched around was transformers and gi joe yo joe so i mean and look i was about to say no i wouldn't give him a franchise at all you, you changed my mind. That is one. G.I. Joe is a franchise I would give. Because you know what? It couldn't get any worse than the, what we've got so far from G.I. Joe films. So I would be, yeah, I would give him a shot at G.I. Joe. Because what does Michael Bay know best? Military. He has a huge love for the military. He honors the military in almost everything he does. It would be, I, w- I would give him a shot at G.I. Joe. What if he produces a G.I. Joe movie directed by Peter Berg? I was about to say Peter Berg. Then you've got a movie that I'm lining up to see. Now we know, and knowing is half the battle. All right, guys, that'll do it for this installment of Mailbag. Thanks for joining us. Don't forget, we'll be back again tomorrow for Sunday's edition. You won't be here, but I'm going to be joined by uh, the current uh, movie trivia champion, John Roca. Oh, be joining that's me for cute. That. Does this studio have parking for his horse? <laughs> The outlaws coming in. We got a stall out back for him that he'll be able to sit in. So he's going to be back for that. Make sure you join us. Hey, guys, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. Click the subscribe button. It'll keep you up to date on all the videos we've got going on here. Don't forget, we've got that great new show with Jeremy Johns. Awesome tacular. It's on the Verizon Go 90 network. But make sure you check out Heroes, Jedi Council, the movie trivia showdown, all the great stuff that we've going on here. And thank you for being a part of it. And Mark, where can people find you online? Uh, online, you can find me at Mark Ellis Live on Twitter. Tonight, I'll be at the world famous comedy store right down the road on Sunset Strip. John, rumors abound that the outlaw might actually be attending the show. So when you film Mailbag with him, ask him how he thought the Ellis did on stage. Will he get up and belittle the audience? Like, just, just randomly pick out people in the audience if, to belittle if them? If I could get one of my friends to film it, there's a, if I see him in the front row, I'm pulling the owl on stage, and the owl on Baby Care is going to go at it right there. And, of course, you guys can simply follow me on Facebook and on Twitter, just at John Campia. That'll do it for us, guys. Thanks so much for joining us, and until next time, bye-bye.